Hi there, it's Arlen and Elsa Salty, and this is the Break Forth Journeys podcast. This is the podcast that brings you from the comfort of your home to walk the pages of Scripture in the very lands of the Bible. Most of these recordings are from our main spiritual teacher for all of our Break Forth Journeys tours, the renowned award-winning author from Sweden, Reverend Hans Weisbrot. But before we get into our show today, we want to invite you to join us for one or more more of our spiritual journeys to the lands of the Bible. Every tour sells out, so please ask for your free brochures today at BreakforthJourneys.com. Today, we want to highlight our next tour, Break Forth Israel and Jordan Next Level, in October 2021. We'll spend time at biblical sites in Israel, biblical sites in Jordan, as well as the jaw-dropping sites of Petra and Wadi Rum. But we want to let you know that we're almost sold out with only a few spots left. So if you want to experience the spiritual journey of a lifetime with Hans, Elsa and me, our worship team, local teachers, and so much more, please go to BreakForthJourneys.com today before every spot is gone. Please don't delay. Okay, now let's get started with today's teaching from Hans. The last two chapters of the Bible let us look behind the veil into heaven. The prophecies show us that heaven is a real place that will surpass our wildest expectations. Join this session that will present heaven for you and answer many questions. Now, here's Hans. Heaven, our eternal future. Um, One church father. I don't know how to pronounce it, his name in English, but I'll try. You say Ephraim? Ephraim the Syrian? An early church father? He said like this. Uh, hope, no, faith is to hear the tone from heaven. Faith is to hear the tone from heaven. Hope is to dance to that tone already here and now. Faith is to hear the tone from heaven. Um, Hope is to dance to that tone already here and now. And um, let me just read Revelation chapter 21 from verse 1 to start off this session. John writes, a vision he saw when he got to glimpse into eternity. I read. Revelation 21 from verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as his bride, as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he will dwell among them. And they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right. For these words are faithful and true. Let's pray. Holy Father, we just thank you so much for the eternal hope. We thank you so much that you are an eternal God. You transcend time. And uh, you have created an eternal world. And we thank you so much that you have called us. You have invited us. You have promised us that we will have the great privilege To live in that world forever with you if we just accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. So thank you so much, Lord, for that hope. And Lord, just bless us as we today try to open the Bible, the Scripture, your own word. uh, And and we just try to, to look at all these texts about our eternal hope. Come, Lord, with the Holy Spirit. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to just come right now. Even though it's early, even though we have listened to many blessed things throughout the whole weekend. 
uh, even though we might be a little bit tired, uh, Lord, just come with your Holy Spirit right now. On the eighth day, the first day, Sunday, the resurrection day, we pray, come with your Holy Spirit and just bless us today. That we pray to you, Father, in the name of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay. Um, my first number one here is get prepared. Get prepared. You know, how many here sometimes go on vacation? And you know, most people, I, I guess lots of people here don't live in Edmonton, right? But if you live in Edmonton, maybe you go to some exotic place like Calgary. Yeah. Or maybe you go a little bit further, right? And maybe even you go down to LA or New York or even to Europe. Maybe someone has been to the strange country Sweden for vacation. Uh, oh, wonderful. I can recommend it in, in May. Do not go in November. <laughs> Anyways, you know, if we are to go on vacation, especially if we are to go on like a, a, a vacation for a long time or far away from here, we have invested money, right? We, have, we are going to invest time. And therefore, we often buy some kind of, you say, leaflet, booklet, small book, to, to, to you know, read about uh, the destination. So we are prepared, right? So we can adjust. So we can get the most out of the experience once we get there, right? We can spend quite a lot of time doing, doing this. That's like a part of the vacation, right? Before it starts. Well, you know, how long do we go on vacation for? One week, two weeks, three weeks. I mean, long vacation is like one month, right? After that, at least I go almost crazy. You know, I have to start work. It takes me two days before I get crazy. <laughs> My wife knows that, so, so, so I'm allowed to bring some work, you know. Just work a couple of hours per day, and then I'll be calm with the rest. Anyways, you know, this we do when we are going on vacation like a couple of weeks. Uh, let me ask you now, for how long are we going to be in heaven? You know, I would get really disappointed if Jesus said to me, when I get to heaven, welcome, my beloved child, you'll get to stay for two weeks. Right? So we are going to spend eternity in heaven. You know, wouldn't it be a good idea to read lots in the Bible about heaven so we can be prepared? So it's important to get prepared. And my... Second point here, Roman numeral two, is one way, one way. And Jesus talks about this in a very classic Bible verse, John 14, chapter 14, verse 6. And he says like this, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So according to scripture, there is only one way to heaven. Not two ways, not three ways, one way. And that way is not first and foremost a theory, a principle. No, that way is first and foremost a person, right? Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for all of humanity's sins. So he could provide atonement, forgiveness for you and me, by grace alone. That is good news, right? You know, we can't pay the ticket to heaven. My friend, that ticket is too expensive. You can't pay the price your sins costed Jesus. My friend, that price is too expensive. Only one person has paid that price, and that is Jesus Christ, who died for our sins on the cross. The only way to get to heaven is through Jesus Christ and his atoning death on the cross, believing that 
and therefore receiving his forgiveness. So there's only one way to heaven. And you know, that's in a way a very serious message, right? Because that means that you and me, we know the way, the only way to heaven. You know, it's like we have lifeboats with us. And we can offer these lifeboats to other people. And it's the most important lifeboat that ever has existed. Right? Roman numeral three. Roman numeral three. And that is the greatest reward. Now, what will happen in heaven? Of course, we don't know exactly what will happen, you know, by detail. But God has actually told us much in scripture. Uh, he has actually let people, you know, see heaven for real, right? John did not just get a message about heaven. John did not just get, you know, some clues about heaven. John did not just get, you know, like a symbolic uh, message about what heaven maybe would be like. No, John, according to scripture, John and, and, and several other prophets got to actually see with his eyes into heaven. See? He's been there for real. And what does he say? Well, I'll just start up here with one verse and we read actually an introduction at the beginning of this session. Right now, I'm going to read Revelation chapter 22, verse 4. Verse 4. It goes like this. John says about us, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. They will see his face. And if we read different passages that are describing heaven, we, we, we find out that you and me, are going to meet God himself, the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You are to meet him, you know, between four eyes. It's not like, you know, we arrive a couple of billions and we see, you know, God far off and, and we have little flags waving, you know, and, you know, it's like being at the rock concert, right? And you say, oh, he looked at me, he looked at me. No, no, no. You're going to have a personal encounter with God himself. For example, it says that God is going to wipe away every tear from every eye. That's something you do in a very personal way, right? God is omnipresent. He's the only one that can do this. So you will meet God between four eyes in a very personal way. You will actually see his face. And that is the greatest reward. That is the greatest reward in heaven. Um, and I think, you know, that is our deepest longing, right? Since the fall of sin, since the fall of men, mankind, man, in Genesis 3, death and sin has been prevailing here on earth. But mankind has kept that memory from heaven, kept that memory, uh, that longing, right? Uh, not the least longing for a face to actually see them and look upon them with 100% love. You know, I got three kids and when they were small, you know what the most common thing was that they said? Whatever they did, they always seem to, you know, come into the room where I was. It could be a car. It could be shooting an arrow at me. It could be eating candy. Whatever it was, they always said to me, Daddy, look. And, you know, we do that too, but we don't do it. We do it in more subtle ways, right? We want somebody to see us with 100% love. In heaven, you're going to meet God. That will be the greatest reward, right? Uh, we will never understand God fully. And if I was to use one word to describe how I think it will be when we meet God, when we encounter the Almighty, the word would be more. More. 
M O R E, more. I think you will be more holy, more loving, more fearful, more complex, more simple, more natural, more personal, more everything. More. And he will, he will always continue to amaze us, even in heaven. Uh, you can't be bored in heaven. It's just impossible. Uh, sometimes people have a very strange view about heaven. You know, they think like, uh, either they think in, in a very abstract way. They think like this, you know, um, well, what's heaven? You know, it's spiritual. We're like spirits. So we're like some kind of spiritual, you know, uh, cloud of gas moving around in heaven. Other people think like, you know, what's going to happen in heaven? Let's, let's wait now. Um, I, I'm sitting on a white cloud. And I'm playing a harp. And uh, I'm singing a song to God. And, and we know there's no time in heaven in a sense. But still in our fantasy, we arrive in heaven a thousand years later. And I'm sitting on the same cloud singing the same song. And I think like, oh, exciting. Not. But, you know, you can never be bored in heaven. You can never be bored in heaven. Uh, so the greatest reward is that you will meet God. He will transcend all your expectations. He will transcend all your expectations. And, you know, already God is with us, right? Through the Holy Spirit. So God is here. But in a sense, we are longing for that, you know, encounter when we will see him with our physical eyes, never to leave him again. This moment is the most important moment in your entire existence. So the Lord tells you about this beforehand so you can prepare, so you can live according to his will, so you will be motivated. Uh, next is four. We shall all be changed. We shall all be changed or transformed. And I read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Paul writes, and he writes like this. Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Changed or transformed is just a good word. Uh, the Greek word is metamorphe. Metamorphe, and that means change one's appearance. And, and uh, when Paul is teaching about this, one of the, the, the pictures he uses is, you know, a seed, you know, a seed, you put it in something brown called earth, soil, up comes what? A beautiful flower, right? You know, when I look myself in the mirror, Monday morning, it's not hard to, you know, think about yourself as a little seed, right? Brown and nothing to the eye. It dies, if it dies with Christ, up comes a beautiful flower. That's you and me. That's transformation. The Holy Spirit wants to transform us more and more already here on earth, right? But, you know, in heaven, that will be fully accomplished. And I, you know, I imagine you standing before God and just going like this. You know, you met him, you, you just awestruck, you, and, and, but suddenly you go like, wait, wait, wait. dear God, uh, 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 Jesus, uh, uh, something has happened to me. Uh, what is it? And it's transformation. What will that mean? Well, firstly, no more sin. No more sin. Right now, Mankind, also Christians, have inherited sin. And the deepest word for sin in the Hebrew means something crooked. You say crooked? It's supposed to be straight, and it is 
rich, crooked. Um, that's why it's such a challenge for us to love God over everything and love our neighbor as ourselves. I don't know about Canada, but in Sweden, that's a challenge for people. I don't know about Canada, but in Sweden, people fail a lot, even Christians. And that creates lots of frustration, right? Uh, I mean, you know, what does it mean? It means that we so often sin, so often do not do what we felt we should have done, and we do, we do things we should not have done, right? Uh, and we know that we grieve the Lord's heart, and it's painful for us. So many times we have this, you know, ambition. Today I'm going to live a holy life. Today I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to love my neighbor. I'm going to walk in faith. And then, you know, some days that works, but some days that do not work as well. Right? Envy. Envy to compare yourself with other people and, and, and feeling inferior. Or be filled with pride. Right? Well, can you imagine in heaven? For the first time in your existence, you're perfect. No inheritable sin. You're perfect. You're perfect. You know, people ask me sometimes, Hans, you know, what happens if I sin in heaven? And I tell them, you can't sin in heaven. Because in heaven, you're 100%, you know, you're perfect. No crookedness. No original sin. You can't sin. You know, the heaven is the best of both worlds, right? You cannot sin, and at the same time, you have 100% freedom. Isn't that an, an attractive combination? Both and. The best of two worlds. So you're perfect. No more envy. No more sin. No more failure. Uh, uh, no more being disappointed with yourself. Uh, but you're perfect. And, and then other things that are, you know, connected to the fall of sin... Uh, 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 no more death. I'm 43. And my wife often reminds me uh, that, you know, my body is getting older. I have, I have a son. He's 17. He's one of the best in Sweden in running. If I were to go out, you know, running in his pace, I would die after 100 meters. <laughs> right? You see, that, that's, that's already death starting to, 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 to affect me, right? No more sicknesses in heaven. Never getting sick, never getting disappointed, never uh, 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 being sad, never again. Can you imagine that? You know, not surprising that people, once they get to heaven, uh, they like cry, you know, not tears of grief. It's tears of redemption. It's tears of redemption when they understand everything that I believed about Christ and eternity and eternal hope and salvation and grace and mercy and hope. Everything was true. Um, and then, you know, in heaven... I, I think C.S. Lewis is right here. You know, C.S. Lewis makes an unbiblical experiment, but to find some biblical truth. That was something, right? An unbiblical experiment to, to find some biblical truth. <laughs> so what he does is that he makes a bus go up to heaven with people who are not transformed. And you know how they are in heaven? They, they, they are in heaven like I think I would be in heaven. If I was not transformed and I came to heaven as I am right now, or you came to heaven as you are right now, not being transformed, not being glorified. You know what we would look like? I think we would, we would be like, you know, gray shadows. And we would be, compared to everyone in heaven, we would be, you and me, also you, we would be incredibly stupid. Because in heaven, you know, your senses will be just transformed. For the first time in your existence, you will understand fully what God meant when he created human beings. Your sight, your hearing, there's music in heaven, they say. Won't that be interesting to listen to that music? I mean, music here is wonderful, isn't it? Especially godly music, right? 
but up there it will be, you know, fulfilled. It will be perfect music. Your smell, taste, feel, all this will be just, you know, in another dimension. So you will be transformed. Does it start to, you know, sound attractive to get to heaven? Okay, and we move on. Next thing. Um, My next Roman numeral five, and I hope I say this correctly in English. You say Bima, the Bima. B-E-M-A. Bima. Bema. Bima. Bima. Yeah, okay, I'm right. Bima. Let's look at Romans 14, verse 10 to 12. Romans 14, 10 to 12. And I read. John, uh, excuse me, Paul is writing. And he writes like this. Romans 14, 10 to 12. But you... Why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. Hallelujah! We're going to the judgment seat. (laughs) <laughs> Wonderful, isn't it? You go like, well, Hans, wait a second now. Uh, before you said that, you know, all our sins are taken care of. We, we, we're forgiven. We go there only by grace. We cannot pay our own way. He has paid the price. And now you're talking about the judgment seat. You know, it makes me kind of uh, nervous. Well, let me tell you what the word is in the Greek. In the Greek, the word is B E. M A Bima. And you know, often we think about to whom the letter was written or, or to where the letter was sent. And this letter was sent to where? Rome. But we seldom think about from where the letter was written. Because God often, you know, used the environment that people lived in to communicate his prophetic message to them, right? So from where was the letter to Romans sent? Edmonton? Stockholm? No. Corinth. Corinth. And I should maybe show you a picture, but uh, I'm not so good at technical things. Please excuse me for that. But I was in Corinth um, last time a couple of months ago. I went around the ruins. I have a very strange interest. I like to go to biblical places and I have the Bible in my hand and I like to go around, you know, praying, uh, reading scripture, talking to people, you know, at the place about uh, different things. And I, I, I just, the Bible just opens up. And, you know, if you're in Corinth, there's only ruins left today, right? But that was a big city at Paul's time and he was living in that city when he wrote the letter to Romans, okay? And in the middle of the city was something that was, you know, a thing that was very common in Roman cities. And that was the Bema, or Rostrum, it's called also, Rostrum. And that was uh, basically, you know, uh, 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 this platform. Uh, think about this platform, huh? Use your fantasy. You can do that, right? Yeah, and then think that it w- it's like, you know, three times as long. And think that it is like um, ten times as high. Up here, a big platform, a big stage it was. And on that stage, the mayor sat, the governor, the one who had authority. And he could reside there, you know, to make announcements, to, you know, give out prizes if it had been like a contest. They were, you know, they liked sports at that time also. And he could also be up there, you know, in a, in, in a, a, a legal case, you know, to, 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 to judge who was guilty, who was not guilty. Well, now, the Bible has, has told us that, you know, sin is not the issue. 
I say it once again. Sin is not the issue. Jesus has dealt with your sin on the cross. He has paid the price. Your sin will not be the issue in heaven because you only get there by grace alone. That's kind of comforting, isn't it? Okay, so we can relax. Please relax. Try to relax. You know, I tried to learn how to go downhill skiing. It didn't go so well. I was very stiff. For a couple of years, I tried to go like this. Then one person just came up from, from behind, and he was really good at, at downhill. And he just tapped my shoulder, and he said one word that really, you know, made me uh, become a lot better skier. He said just, you know, relax. So relax. At the same time, there is a sobering message here. There is a challenge from the word of God to us here, and that is in verse 12, because it says, you know, only grace... Uh, we only get it by grace. It's not about our sins. But in verse 12, it says, so then each one of us will give an account of himself to God. And to, to, to uh, give you another passage where Paul uh, writes about this, I will read first letter to Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 11 to 16. Um, First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 to 16. It's about the same thing, about the Bema. And I read. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is led, laid, excuse me, which is Jesus Christ. So this is all about Christians, right? This is about people who have built on the only foundation that you can build on to get to eternity, and that is Jesus Christ, right? So now he's writing about Christians, and he goes on, and he writes like this. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. If any man's work, which he has built on it, remains, he will receive a reward. Uh, If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? You know, of course, it would be a lot nicer not to read this verse. You know, just preach about heaven. But I think... It's there in scripture because you and I need to hear it. Because it's, you know, it's very natural. What would be the opposite? The opposite would be we get to heaven and Jesus says, you know, welcome my beloved child to heaven and you know, your life. We don't speak about that. You know, just go in. The wonderful thing is that he's not going to take up our sins because he's died for those on the cross. But listen, my friend, he will walk you through your life And you will get to see what kind of fruit your life bore. He will walk you through your life. Not the sins. They're gone. He took them on the cross. You can relax. But in another sense, he says, he will walk you through your life. And you will see what kind of fruit your life bore. And uh, he gets, and you know, he says this beforehand. Probably that is because he wants you to know that this morning. Right? Um, And please note, I have written here, you know. This is not about statistics. I think we often think that, you know, we think that Jesus is, you know, going to, you know, go through, you know, how many people did you preach to? How many people were converted through your life? Uh, uh, How much? You know, the statistics is no problem for God. He can fix the, the statistics himself, the numbers. No, words I wrote that are much more important is words like this. A couple of them. I think it's very biblical. If you want to know what's going to be the issue, purpose, what was your purpose? Why did you do what you did? Next word, 
faithfulness. Being faithful to Christ and his word and the testimony and confession about him and to him. The next word and last word is a word that is so common in the Bible that is heart. Please make a survey in the Bible about heart. Lev in Hebrew, kardia, Greek, and you will find that heart is not, you know, romantic feelings as it is in the Western world. The heart in the biblical uh, uh, world stands for the center of your personality. Maybe we should say our will. Our innermost self, our center. And God is very interested in what's in your heart. And just a, a quick little witness here from my life. Unfortunately, this is really, you know, confessing my, my, my weaknesses, but I do it willingly, no problem. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, I'm inherited sin sits so deep in me that I needed to hear this message. When I heard this message in 1998, when I understood, you know, everything is grace. Of course, you know, no sins in heaven. I knew that one. But when I understood also that Jesus actually is going to evaluate my life, it was like, you know, it was like a wake-up call like nothing else. And, you know, this wake-up call, of course it affected me when I preach. But I would say, and, you know, I, I sin every day, so don't get me wrong. I need forgiveness every day. But where it affected me the most was And listen carefully, when no one else sees what I do in the hidden, it affects me more there, actually. So, uh, and you know, unfortunately, I am and was so sinful. You know, one, one could think that, you know, we don't need to hear that. We don't need to be better to receive a reward. You know, all rewards are grace anyways, right? Rewards in heaven might be, you know, a bigger potentiality to praise the Lord or whatever, you know. Uh, it's not money, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, but we could think like, you know, we don't need to hear about any reward. That's kind of carnal. Well, sorry, I... I Unfortunately, sin sits so deep in me that I needed to hear that actually God is going to go through, walk through my life together with me when I get to heaven. Maybe you need that too. My prayer for you is, my prayer for you is like this. I pray that you would Make this the most important desire in your life. You know, the thing to kind of make us as number one in your life. To live a life. I'm not talking about, you know, legalistic. I'm not talking about not having joy in our life. I'm not talking about not resting. I'm not talking about not having fun. I'm not talking about anything of these things. But I am talking about having as the greatest goal in our life that one time... We want to have lived a life that we want Jesus to walk through together with us. Roman numeral six. Last, the wonderful world, the wonderful world, you know, then God will say, my beloved child, welcome into heaven forever. And I will now Uh, read from Revelation chapter 21 to just give you some glimpses into what we might find in that world. Revelation chapter 21, and I read from verse 10. Are you awake? Thank you. I read from verse 10, and it goes like this. Uh, and he carried me away, Revelation 21, 10. And he carried me away 
in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. You say jasper? And you know what stone that was? Diamond. Like a diamond. And what he says is, you know, it's like a diamond, but the light comes from within the diamond. And, and, and our eternal future city, Jerusalem, comes from heaven like a, like a big diamond. But the, the light is coming out from the diamond. And it's not any light. It's the kavod. It's the glory of God. It's our deepest longing. I don't know about you in Edmonton. But in Sweden, it's, we are further up north than you guys. Lots of people in Sweden have like, you know, darkness all day long through the winter. And you know when, when like March comes, like the first spring day when we really have sun and it gets a little bit warmer, you can see people coming out from their houses, going like, <laughs> oh, and like that. You know, light is our deepest longing. That's, you know, from creation up in heaven, you will just, you know, encounter God's own glory. And that light from Jerusalem will just fill you. And I can also comment on another thing right away. Some people ask me like this, Hans, uh, will we recognize each other in heaven? And, and I would say that it, it's biblical to say, in heaven is the first time you really will recognize each other. You know about the lost son, the prodigal, pro, so hard for the sweet to say, prodigal son? Prodigal, the prodigal son. You know about him? You know when he repented? You remember that story Jesus told? When he repented, what does he say in the Greek? He doesn't say he repented. It says, he came to himself. You see, the Holy Spirit wants you to be, be created to the one you were meant to be. And when inheritance sin goes, for the first time, you become 100% the person God from the beginning created you to be. So you will be, for the first time, 100% yourself. And this might sound like terror, but in heaven, it's the first time you will meet 100% me. Even more me than right now. You can, you can have another corner in heaven. That's fine. You know, but. So you will be 100% yourself. And you know, in, in, you know remember the, the Mount of Transfiguration? That's probably not uh, Tabor. Uh, it's probably the Mount Hermon. You know the Mount Hermon? Northern Israel? I've been walking up on the top of that mountain. The, the soldiers let us walk and we were prayer walking just along the Syrian border. And they let us actually be there on an outpost exactly by the border way up on the mountain where we could see over Syria and we could see over Israel uh, and, and a cloud came down and it was not hard to become over spiritual. <laughs> but you know, on that mountain, uh, Peter, James and John got to see Jesus transformed, right? That was the most important thing, of course. But they also got to encounter Moses and Elijah, right? And they did not say, you know, oh, we see two uh, spiritual gas clouds, you know. Hmm. No, they said Moses and Elijah, you know, they, they, they were more recognizable than ever. So in heaven, you will for sure recognize each other. And, you know, we have no inherited sin. That means we won't hurt each other again. Isn't that painful today that we can hurt each other? Even, you know, husband and wife, even parents and kids, even our best friends. Sometimes we can hurt each other, misunderstand each other and so on. That will never happen in heaven again. And, you know, in heaven, we, we can live like really intimately close to each other, but we won't hurt each other. So we have the best, best again of two worlds. You know, we are intimately close to each other, but we won't hurt each other. And we will live together with God, with together, 100% clean, pure, uh, and it will be 100% love. I keep on reading. Verse um, 12 to 14. 
It had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Uh, so what you also can note here is very interesting, and it comes back again uh, a little bit later in the text. It talks about how kings, uh, we can even uh, read that verse so we get it right away. Uh, verse 24, Revelation 21, it says like this. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. See? Uh, and we, we read uh, about the names of the apostles, the names of the tribes of Israel. Firstly, you can note that even, you know, both the apostles of the church and Israel have a continuation in heaven eternally. Right? In a very concrete way. And you can also secondly note here that there seems to be some kind of continuation from the earth here up until heaven. Right? That, that, you know, all the good things, the things that God thinks are good, not necessarily the things that we think are good, <laughs> might not always be the same, right? Uh, but, but all the good things, including lots of joy, including, you know, uh, 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 you know creative things, culture, whatever, all these things will like be fulfilled in heaven. So in that sense, we can say that all the good things, all the joyful things uh, that are according to God's will, that are really creative, uh, up here, no, down here on earth, will have their continuation in heaven. They will be fulfilled in heaven. I read on, verse 15 to 16. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as the, and this is hard for a Swede, W-I-D-T-H, width. Yeah, width. And he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. Uh, and this is most uh, interesting because this really talks about, you know, heaven According to John, being, or, or no, not heaven. The heaven is, an, you know, like maybe biggest universe. Who knows? But, but we're talking about Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, the center in heaven. It's described as a big cube. It's equally long, equally wide, equally high, equally deep. And someone has measured the cube. And uh, you know, I don't know if you're good at European geography. And we don't know, you know, the heavenly measurements. I don't want to be too concrete here in a way, but, but, but I'll just give you an idea uh, how John might have perceived this. Um, you know where Stockholm is, approximately? You know, the North Pole and one click down? <laughs> Count to Stockholm. And then you go from Stockholm to Vienna. Stockholm to Vienna is like um, two and a half hours with airplane, something like this. The cube is big enough to fit approximately between Stockholm and Vienna. And it is as long as it is high as it is wide. And does that remind you of something? This is 17 points, if you get this biblical question. 17 points. Anyone want to walk from here with 17 points? You can get a chewing gum from me. Even. The love of Christ was a wonderful answer, and I mean, that will never be wrong. You know, I will never say that's wrong. <laughs> that's wonderful. You know, it's like in Sunday school. Jesus is always the right answer. <laughs> and so that's right. But, but uh, the, the, the thing I was thinking about is, you know, in Hebrew, Kodesh Kodashim, the holiest of the holy. The innermost room in the temple was in perfect harmony. It was as wide as it was high as it was deep. And the same thing with heaven. Jerusalem is like the holiest of the holy, totally accessible for everybody living in heaven, uh, extremely big, uh, 
several dimensions, right? It's being high also. That's like at least three dimensional with God's glory uh, in total harmony. And I read verse 18 and 19. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second, oh, this is so hard for a sweet, sapphire, the third, chalcedony, the fourth, emerald. Yeah, you know. And, and then it goes on. And let me just give you one here. You know, this tells us that there's color in heaven. Right? These different stones, they are like green, they are red, they are purple. So we have color in heaven. The heavenly world seemed to be like more real than our world. More spiritual, but also more concrete. See? So in heaven... The water will taste more water. The trees will be like more trees. You know, when I come to heaven and I see a tree, I will go to the tree and I'll go like, okay, now this is a tree. More concrete. And... Um, We have eight, nine minutes. Let's read from 22.1 till verse 5. That's the end of the vision. And this is the last verses in the vision John receives. From verse 6 and on, he concludes. It's also the word of God. It's 100% inspirated. It's infallible. But the vision seeing into heaven is verse 1 to 5. So let's move into the very center of New Jerusalem. It goes like this. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And um, here you see the tree of life. Right? The tree of life. Where did you see that tree before in the Bible? The Garden of Eden, right? That was what mankind was not allowed to access after the fall of sin, the fall of man. The way is open again to the tree of life. So there's a tree of life in the beginning of the Bible. The tree of life comes back, the same tree in the end of the Bible. And there's a tree of life in the middle of the Bible, right? The cross. The cross is always the tree of life, right? It's not a coincidence that Jesus died on tree, on wood. Right? And... Um, let me just give you one little uh, testimony. I know a woman in Sweden, and this is talking about, you know, you know when the Holy Spirit comes? He came to me this morning as I was praying my morning. He's always with us, right? But he also comes in a special way when we pray to him, right? Only by grace alone, right? So I prayed this morning, morning prayer at the Westin Hotel overlooking Edmonton. Uh, like six o'clock in the morning and all these lights, six thirty was actually. And um, I, I could sense, you know, it was very, you say, subtle, subtle, hard for sweet to say, subtle. And it was like a whisper from the Lord, his presence just coming like this. Uh, and, you know, don't underestimate the anointing of the Holy Spirit. His fruit is love, peace, joy. And you know what? He always comes from heaven. So praying and asking the Holy Spirit to come is like opening a window to the eternal summer, wherever you are. 
And therefore, it's tragic that we don't ask more for the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, to just anoint us. Right? And there's power. There is power. There is power in that anointing. Let me give you just one testimony. A woman about the tree of life also, connected to the tree of life. A woman I know, she's my age. She's a colleague to my wife, actually, at her work. When she was 12, she asked her mother a very, you know, childish question, but, you know, sincere. She said to her mother, you know, mom, when we get to heaven, you know, maybe you and I get to heaven, you know, at different times. We die on different, you know, times. Uh, how will we find each other? And the mother said, I know. Let's meet at the tree of life. It's big, probably in the center of heaven. She thought, you know, that's a good childish answer, right? So she said that. And, and the daughter was, you know, very pleased. Good, concrete answer, like for a 12-year-old. Perfect. Then life went on. I told you she's as old as me right now. So this was like 30 years ago. Around 10 years ago, her mother turned sick for several years. Her body was broken down piece by piece. And after a while, her mother started to lose courage. It was painful. Uh, she became sad. And also, a question started to become more and more uh, overwhelming in a negative way for her. And that was, you know, is the Christian faith for real? I think that's a question many people ask from time to time, especially when they encounter death or sickness. Then came one evening, you know, her mother had become more and more saddened, grieved. And uh, they were sitting in her room in the hospital talking. And uh, this was actually going to be the last night of her life. But they did not know that. Not the daughter, not the mother, they didn't know that. But they were sitting there talking. And, you know, the mother was sad in kind of a negative way. Almost bitter. And she had, like, lost hope. Not lost her faith. Not her saving faith. But, you know, struggling with hope. Suddenly, her daughter remembered that conversation that they had when she was 12 years old. And she could sense, you know, it was the Holy Spirit reminding her. So she said to her mother in an anointed way, because the presence of God was starting to come. And she said to her mother, Mom, you should not be afraid. Remember what we said when I was 12 years old? We'll meet at the tree of life. And you know, it was like a window of heaven just opened in. Totally illogic, right? But it happened because heaven is for real. Do you believe that? We're talking about the reality here. Heaven is real. Holy Spirit always anoints us, comes to us from heaven. So ask for it more. And, and the Holy Spirit just came in and, you know, her mother was like, <gasps> that often happens when I pray for people and, and when the Holy Spirit comes to me and I receive prayer or whatever, you know, that often happens when the Holy Spirit comes. You can see like, a, <gasps> it's like, <laughs> it's like oh, power, right? God's helium, right? Coming in, it's like, <laughs> anyways, so they had this wonderful talk. The last evening of her life, you know, and they talked about life and, you know, they, 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 it was like a, 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 an atmosphere of thankfulness, of gratitude, both of them. And they were talking and they were crying and they were laughing and they were hugging, you know, and they were doing all these things. And after that, late in the evening, you know, and her mother usually only could maybe could be up 10 minutes, 15 minutes or something like that, I guess. At, at that time, you know, they were sitting for a long time. And then the daughter said, you know, they said bye. And they didn't know it was for, for until eternity, but, but that was what it was. Then she went home and in the morning they called from the hospital saying that your mother is dead. She had gone home. So... Uh, What did I say from the beginning? I said, Ephraim the Syrian. Remember him? The great church father. He said, faith is hearing the tone from heaven. Hope is to dance to that music already here and now.
Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Break Forth Journeys podcast. We pray you were richly blessed. Before we leave you today, we want to remind you that you can experience an incredible spiritual journey of a lifetime to the lands of the Bible with Hans as your spiritual teacher at virtually every biblical site on the tour. We also serve as leaders as well as leading in times of worship and prayer along the way. As you can imagine, having Hans as your teacher, every tour sells out, sometimes a year or more in advance. If you'd like to learn more about our tours, see beautiful photos of the Holy Lands, read blog posts about new discoveries, as well as to receive a free copy of our book, The Christian Pilgrim's Insider's Guide, please head over to BreakForthJourneys.com. Until next time, may God richly bless you day by day.